followers of the way, the true Buddha has no shape, the true Dharma has no form. You put on top of your delusion only further fantasies, such is the way of outsiders. Though you may attain something that way, it is only the spirit of a wild fox and not the true Buddha. The true student of the way clings neither to Buddha, nor to Bodhisattvas, nor to Arhats. He clings not to anything that passes as supreme in the three worlds. He keeps his distance, stands alone and free, and is not bothered by things. Though heaven and earth be turned upside down, he will not be bewildered. Though all the Buddhas of the ten directions appear before him, he will not care. And if the three deepest hells suddenly gape before him, he will not be afraid. Why not? Because he sees everything as empty. If there is change, there is also existence. Without change, there is nothing. The three worlds are the heart only. The ten thousand things are but its differentiation. That is why it is said, dreams and phantoms, flowers in the empty sky. Why trouble yourself to seize them? This is just part of a sermon given by Master Rinzai from his uh, record, the record of his collected sermons that was taken down by his followers. And here, once again, we see that Master Rinzai is very familiar with the uh, teachings of the Mahayana and also with the early teachings too because he refers to them here. But he begins by calling followers of the way and of course, we know he's talking uh, to his monks uh, in the monastery. And of course, in the monasteries in those days, this is China, in the ninth century, they were very, very large affairs indeed. About 800 to 1,000 monks uh, would be collected together in that training place. And these followers of the way, followers of, well, what way? Well, um, doctrinally, this is the great way. The Mahayana, which is what the Mahayana actually means. And it's the great way, this is the Bodhisattva way, uh, that leads to awakening, that leads to, in fact, the Buddha's insight, because this is really what the Mahayana uh, is about. It was a change from the, uh, what was known as the Arhat path, which was to escape from samsara into nirvana. Instead, it was to become a fully realized Buddha. And, and here now we, re we realize doctrinally um, that our hats are not the same um, as Buddhas. Um, our hats are able to save themselves doctrinally. They're able to, as it were, stop the wheel of life uh, by unpicking the 12 linked chain of arising due to conditions, otherwise known as the Pratichit Samuppada. Um, this, in Zen terms, if we're familiar with the bull herding pictures, is the equivalent to the first few um, links. Sorry, the first few uh, 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 pictures. We know we have that first picture of the man in the wilderness searching for the bull. Then he finds the traces of the bull. Then he ca catches sight of the rear end of the bull. Then he's got hold of the bull and he's struggling with him. Then he's uh, leading the bull um, and then he's sitting on the back of the bull uh, and then he finds himself um, on the mountain peak with the, um, uh, that picture called uh, Bull Forgotten, Man Remains and, and that really is the stage of the Arhat when the bull which is of course our emotional complex uh, particularly that emotional complex that's uh, up to this point been conditioned by I uh, conditioned to react to uh, my wants and my dislikes to how things suit me and to my fears etc now all that bundle of I me and mine has been laid down and the bull in itself has actually been forgotten and at that particular on that particular picture the verse says that of course the uh, herdsman and the bull were merely signposts uh, up to this point, um, like snares for catching hares. Um, they've been set up to, to actually help. And of course, this was the take by the Mahayana on the earlier teachings. If we remember in the Mahayana Sutras, the Buddha, in fact, gave a sermon to his now elderly arhats um, 
telling them the news that in fact they'd only come part way along the path part way along the way um, that actually the rest of the way now beckoned and lay before them uh, and this was the Mahayana and this great way led to full and perfect enlightenment itself in other words that all beings uh, were to become Buddhas and uh, some of the arhats rejoiced and some of the arhats got very upset about it and it's said that 500 of them got up and walked out um, so uh, that wasn't to their taste but this is the Mahayana and the Zen school is firmly part of the Mahayana and so this is the Bodhisattva path the path that leads to uh, full enlightenment and so when uh, Master Rinzai uses this phrase followers of the way which he does uh, frequently in these sermons um, he's reminding his monks and th us also because we are in his lineage um, that this is where we're going and then he says the true Buddha has no shape the true Dharma has no form and of course another thing that the Mahayana did um, as different to the earlier teaching was that they really looked into this question of who actually is the Buddha um, in the early teachings it was taken to be Prince Gautama otherwise known as Shakyamuni who left the palace underwent his own training sat under the Bodhi tree realized uh, the true nature and then spent 45 of his years of his life uh, showing others the way until he died aged 80 but actually the Mahayana took a somewhat more should we say cosmic or perhaps transcendental view uh, of what the Buddha was and this really arose because in their careful study of the early scriptures there were several stories that sort of stood out as being a little bit odd and and one of those was uh, one day when a Brahmin who was a priest uh, questioned the Buddha and said um, who is it that the Buddha who, who, who is the Buddha what is the Buddha and the Buddha said well who is it the people say that that I am he said well some people say that you're a god are you a god and the Buddha replied no Brahmin I'm not a god and so he said well are you a semi-divine being no I'm not a semi-divine being are you an angel no I'm not an angel and he went through this list of sort of spiritual beings and even asking him if he was a demon and the Buddha denied all of these that he was any of these things and finally the Brahmin said well are you a human being and the Buddha replied no Brahmin I'm not a human being and the Brahmin asked who then are you and the Buddha replied I am the Buddha I am awake and of course this is what Buddha means because Buddha is a title of course it's not a name it's a title it means the awakened one comes from the verb bud um, which means to be awake or to wake up and so the question that begged really was well obviously this was being spoken by a man um, who had a physical flesh and blood body uh, but the one who was speaking actually came from somewhere else somewhere beyond him this is the transcendent um, and so from this in the early Mahayanas developed um, a doctrine where there were two bodies of the Buddha there was the appearance body that was known as the Namanakaya and then there was the true body of the Buddha that was known as the Dharmakaya Kaya simply means body and uh, uh, Dharmakaya simply means body of the Dharma uh, but this Dharmakaya um, was something that was regarded as as unseen completely other completely transcendent and it's rather perhaps in the same way when we talk about nature um, often when people talk about nature when we talk about nature we sort of think of you know green trees and flowers and uh, woods and rivers and things like that we, we think of actual physical things as sort of representing nature but but when we talk about the nature of something then actually we're talking about something that's immaterial so uh, 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 
if if we're referring to uh, for example well people talk about mother nature that they're not actually talking about a physical woman um, obviously it's a reference to the principles upon which the manifest nature is seen so now we have these two things we've got nature manifest which is the trees and the rivers and so forth and the birds and so forth uh, and then there's the nature or the principles uh, upon which all those manifest things depend so when we talk about the nature of a dog for example we we're talking about not well its behavior what it looks like and so forth but there's something not quite graspable it's something immaterial when we say the nature of something we're saying that something stands behind that and that what we see arises from or out of those principles and these two bodies of the buddha work in a similar fashion so there is the buddha who came and preached uh, uh, lived and died and became awakened and then there is the principle of Buddha, and the Dharmakaya refers to this principle. And sometimes, in fact, the, the Buddha nature itself, when we talk about all beings having the inherent Buddha nature, uh, sometimes it's referred to in the Zen text as the principle or the great principle. Then if we see that term, then we know it's referring to the Buddha nature. And this is what Master Rinzai is, is also referring to here. Uh, there is that... Uh, sense of the Buddha but actually who has no shape and the Dharma because the Dharma if we remember is uh, can mean the teachings of the Buddha the Buddha Dharma uh, but it can also mean the inherent law or again the inherent principle of all things and if we if we remember that the uh, uh, the path the great way um, leading to Buddhahood means to realize things as they truly are uh, the Buddha's insight was simply simply put to see things as they really are and what that means is to actually see that principle that's immaterial that's behind the manifest i.e. not to be carried away with objects with what's in Chinese is known as the 10,000 things but to actually be aware of the principle that lay behind those things and of course now I think oh well this is definitely something I want to see it's a great mystery it's the great unknown some great occult and esoteric thing which quite literally it is occult because it's hidden and it's esoteric because it's unknown and uh, uh, it appears to be a great secret and is a great secret um, uh, but not a secret in the sense that I normally think that it is I, normally I think that a great secret is something that is intentionally being withheld from me and if I can get into the inner circle then that secret can be revealed to me but it's not that type of secret um, it's secret only in as much as I don't realize it not because it's hidden it's actually not hidden the principle is is always there and again there's a, another saying from the text that says whether or not uh, Buddhas and sages arise in this world the true nature of things that principle the Buddha nature the true nature of things is ever present in other words it's not hidden ever uh, we live out of it we encounter it every single day again the great master Hakuin said uh, the peasant uses it every day but sadly is not aware of it and again Hakuin says uh, in his poem the song of realization uh, pitifully in the midst of water crying out from thirst and all these phrases all these idioms all these metaphors refer to the fact that actually the true nature is ever present but simply because because of our sticky attachments uh, because of the fact that we are deluded um, we cannot see straight we cannot see uh, what is uh, before our eyes and so this Buddha uh, and this Dharma uh, has no shape or no actual form and again perhaps Venerable Myokyoni used to um, liken the, this formless 
groundedness of the Buddha nature or formlessness of the Dharma to being somewhat akin to uh, the body of a wine. Um, we all know, for example, that a, uh, there's such a thing as a full-bodied red wine. Uh, and we can talk about the body of a wine and we can we taste the wine and we can perceive that we can sense that body but it's not possible to take that body out of the wine we cannot extract it from the wine um, and in the same way uh, the Dharma or the principle is not something that's separate from the things that it manifests it's part of them um, and yet it's not part of them uh, it's 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 something that whilst that object is 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 manifest is is always ever present but even when the object isn't there the principle remains even though the principle is nothing and you can't measure it or see it or whatever but should that thing arise again the the nature of it is still there and so rather like the body of a wine it cannot be separated out from things and this is the perhaps something that we make this is a mistake that we make um, for us here particularly in, in, in the West that we have posited a completely separate spiritual realm um, that exists somehow separately from the manifest world and, and this is something that doesn't really exist in, in Buddhism um, although we can read the Mahayana texts and we, they read in a very fantastical way about beings and devas and Gandharvas and uh, all sorts of creatures and so forth uh, we shouldn't think that somehow this is something completely separate or divorced from our ordinary mundane lives um, in fact, even just to call them ordinary and mundane goes against the spirit of the Mahayana because actually uh, what those texts are showing is the magic and the mystery that is already inherent in what is ordinarily ca called a mundane uh, life. So followers of the way, the true Buddha has no shape, the true Dharma has no form. You put on top of your delusion only further fantasies, such as the way of outsiders. Though you may attain something that way, it is only the spirit of a wild fox and not the true Buddha. And in fact, what um, Master Rinzai is, is in fact pointing to with his monks is almost certainly he's talking about those early teachings, the Four Noble Truths, Three Signs of Being, Skandhas, Dhatus, Twelve Link Chains, some of the things we've already mentioned. Um, and what he's really saying about this is that, yes, these things are called the Dharma, they are the existent teachings, but they're not the true Dharma. And the life of the Buddha, as we know, leaving the palace, becoming enlightened and teaching and so forth, yes, this is the story, this is the tradition, but that isn't the true Buddha. This, this is what he's saying. The true Buddha actually, uh, and the true, uh, the true Buddha is in this fathom long body, uh, and the true Dharma is before the eyes all the time ever present and that is this is where we need to be really paying attention to and so really what he's pointing to is a, is a little bit about not getting caught up uh, uh, too much in the teachings to the point where it becomes a substitute for practice uh, that that practice of really giving myself wholeheartedly and looking just really looking into and staying with that looking to see how things come and how things go uh, and to see how the, the heart works and in the midst of that suddenly realizing it and it's rather akin to um, uh, that sort of patient waiting and patient bearing with and patient looking uh, and going on looking um, a good example was actually given by the late Trevor Leggett who when he was living in Japan um, heard about uh, a certain very shy type of Japanese pheasant and they were a very beautiful bird and he there was a, a forest nearby where they they lived and he wants to go and see them so he talked with someone who said oh yes um, if you just go down such and such a path you'll come to a clearing there's a fallen tree sit down on the tree make yourself comfortable you'll have a bit of a wait but that's where they congregate 
So he went down the path, he came to the clearing, and there was this fallen tree, uh, and he clambered up on and seated himself down and sat to wait for them, and he waited for 10 minutes, and he waited for uh, 20 minutes, and he got to about 25 minutes, and he was thinking, you know, <laughs> uh, this, this could be quite a long wait. Uh, perhaps they're not good, perhaps even they, they might not even come. And just as he was thinking that, suddenly just a, less than five feet away from him, one of the birds moved its head and in that instant he suddenly saw it that it had been there all the time and as he now looked round because his eyes now had become acclimatized to what they looked like he suddenly realized the whole clearing was full of them they had been there all the time even when he arrived they had been there they'd simply stood absolutely still and their camouflage was so perfect that until one of them actually moved his 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 eye couldn't differentiate them his eye couldn't actually make them out but having seen one he suddenly realized they were everywhere and that is a really very good analogy for how we realize our own heart our, our own heart and the world in which we live are interlinked they're so interlinked that that actually we don't see that it's our heart that we're reacting to um, a lot of the times, the thoughts and the judgments that we make they, in our picking and choosing and so on uh, are so interwoven with the objects of our desires or the objects of our fears that we don't recognize that it's our own heart. Um, and so it's only by this really staying with it uh, and through this training, uh, long training, that, that we begin to realize just how our heart is absolutely everywhere. We encounter it absolutely everywhere and in everything. However, that's not to say that the teachings are no good. And even Master Rinzai says, though you may attain something that way, he says it's only the spirit of a wild fox. And that's because in uh, Chinese and Japanese folklore, the fox is um, a trickster figure. Um, normally, certainly in Japan, um, one of the things he does is he actually steals brides on their way to their wedding but generally he's a bit of a trickster figure and can lead us on a sort of merry chase uh, and this is really what he's referring to he said the we, we can get led up the garden path by by the teachings as well if we because we don't really know how to take them we don't always realize that they're pointing uh, they're not the thing itself and sometimes we get very stuck on them uh, and we like to dispute and argue uh, rather than actually look and see where they're pointing towards. They're actually pointing beyond themselves. And so this is why he says they are the spirit of a wild fox and not the true Buddha. The true student of the way clings neither to Buddha, nor to bodhisattvas, nor to our hats. And this is probably referring to the row that was going on at the time about whether it should be the more traditional older arhat path or to the bodhisattva path um, and actually Master Rinzai is saying well uh, uh, the true student of the way doesn't cling to either the Lotus Sutra came along and taught the Ekiyana or the one way showing that there were stages on the path and that these were all different simply different stages yeah. and when he says goes on to say he clings not to anything that passes as supreme in the three worlds and those three worlds are the worlds of uh, the world of desire, the world of form, and the formless world. And this really is just another way of saying samsara. It's uh, we're familiar with the six realms on the wheel of life. That's one formulation of samsara. The three worlds is simply another way. The world of desire, uh, which is obviously what it says, our wanting things, seeing something and then wanting it. Um, then there's the world of form, that's the uh, world of physical manifestation. And the formless world is the world of mental objects, because they have no body. Um, so those are the three worlds. In other words, any if anything that appears in those three worlds, either in our desires or in the physical world or, or in our mental range, um, even even if we see it as being completely supreme, um, we should still should not cling to it. And this is brings up that uh, wonderful story of the two Americans who went to uh, Japan. This is in the early days, uh, uh, having read 
something about Buddhism in the West. They went to Japan. Uh, obviously, they were full of this idea that Zen is iconoclastic, it, not dependent on written text. And this had now been interpreted as that we don't need the written text at all and we don't need the complicated teachings, That's which is not what Zen is saying. Hopefully, that's clear. And um, they called in a little, little Zen temple, which was run by a very ordinary Zen priest, no one very famous or special um, and they asked if they could have a look around and he said yes I'll show you around and in his broken English he, he, he took them into the shrine room and there he bowed before the uh, the Buddha the standing Buddha and said this is where we chant in the morning and then took them to the Zendo and there's a statue of Manjushri there and he the Bodhisattva of Wisdom and he bowed before that as he always did and he said this is where we sit Zazen and then he took them to the library and there's a little Buddha on the shelf and he bowed as he walked past it and then to the kitchen and there's another little kitchen Bodhisattva which he bowed to just as he walked past and this is where we prepare the meals and then even in the loos there's a little Bodhisattva there and quite naturally as he always obviously did every day when he walked past he just inclined his head and bowed again uh, still just saying and this is our ablution room and by this point the the two Americans who, who had couldn't believe it and one of them couldn't contain himself anymore and said here you are a, a man of Zen bowing and scraping before these images why I thought you were supposed to be past all this worshipping of idols for goodness sake he said as for me I could spit at them and the the priest and if you think about it he had spent his whole life with these images that these images actually represented his highest ideal this this was the Buddha and the Bodhisattvas no doubt his father had been a priest and his grandfather had been a priest in the same temple before him uh, he had been brought up with Buddhism his entire life you know it was the, it was the complete summation of his life and then suddenly along comes this foreigner who who just says he could spit at that which is which is his supreme ideal and did he get furious and fight back or something and demand a, an inquisition no he didn't he he simply nodded and in his broken english says okay okay he says you spits i bows and there we see someone who really now is not clinging and has certainly as uh, master rinzai says he keeps his distance stands alone and is therefore free and is not bothered by things in other words the passions get no foothold in him because he has that freedom this is not what I am I'm caught up with my passions and therefore there are certain subjects that people know not to talk to me about because it gets me going or they know that I will start spouting my mouth off with all my hot opinions boring the tears off everybody not caring uh, because I want everybody to benefit from my great knowledge and wisdom uh, whereas actually I'm just making a nuisance of myself to others and don't even see it though heaven and earth be turned upside down he will not be bewildered though all the Buddhas of the ten directions appear before him he will not care and if the three deepest hells suddenly gape before him he will not be afraid why not because he sees everything as empty this empty doesn't mean that it doesn't exist what it means is that uh, it is empty of himself he doesn't stake himself on any of it when I have an opinion about something there is something of myself in that opinion and therefore if that opinion gets trounced uh, then I'm trounced and then suddenly that reaction occurs and this is how we know therefore if I'm caught up on something if I get hot under the collar about something and I react then there's still something of myself invested in other words there's still an attachment there if there is change there is also existence without change there is nothing and this really refers to the fact that if I'm wholeheartedly given into what at this moment is then actually there is just that 
state of being at one with and as the circumstances come and go or appear to change that at oneness doesn't change at all uh, instead of that actually what I do which is I'll give myself to this because I like it but that I won't give myself to because I don't like it the three worlds are the heart only well we've looked at that already the heart is everywhere the 10,000 things are but its differentiation this is why it is said dreams and phantoms flowers in the empty sky why trouble yourself to seize them which of course is what I do when I have my attachments instead of recognizing that a dream is a dream again nothing wrong with a dream don't have to be frightened of it or push it away or even from a phantom but once we know it's a phantom then it doesn't pull me along anymore and then there is that real freedom to come and go uh, and having that freedom to come and go actually the heart is free and a free heart is very much in a position then to be able to help others and the natural warmth that arises from that heart too um, then there's no intention that the compassion which doesn't have to be learnt compassion doesn't have to be learnt it already exists in the open and free heart uh, flows quite naturally and touches those around it